I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Alex Karoglian, Director of Education and Training Programs at the Fenway Institute, an Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Alex has been recognized for his leadership in improving healthcare services and reducing disparities for LGBT communities. He is widely published and has spoken extensively on topics that include HIV medication adherence, sexual orientation and gender identity data collection, and homelessness among LGBTQ youth. In addition to his research role at the Fenway Institute, Alex is a clinical psychiatrist within the Behavioral Health Department. We are so pleased to have him with us today. Alex? Thank you, Kate. Hi, everybody. Nice to be speaking with you today. We have a lot of exciting material to cover, and hopefully we'll all learn from each other. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking about LGBTQ health and gaps in medical care, and then pass it on to our next speakers. A quick word about Fenway Health and the Fenway Institute. We're a federally qualified health center in Boston, founded in 1971. From the beginning, Fenway's mission has been focused on the well-being of the LGBTQ community and people in our neighborhoods through high quality care. We're unusual as a health center in that we have an institute within Fenway Health, the Fenway Institute, that focuses on research, education, training, advocacy, and policy for gender and sexual minority people and people living with HIV. Within the Institute is our Division of Education and Training that includes the National LGBT Health Education Center funded by the U.S. Bureau of Primary Health Care. We provide on-site training and technical assistance in all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, live webinars that are then archived and available for free on our website for continuing education credits and health equality index credits. We have a National Transgender Echo Program that's trained up over 125 health centers at this point, and a number of publications, and other resources available for free download from our website on gender and sexual minority health. So feel free to check us out at lgbthealtheducation.org. In many ways, we've made a lot of progress societally toward inclusion in the mainstream fabric of U.S. society of gender and sexual minority people. We've also noticed in recent years some setbacks and rollbacks with regard to rights that were previously enjoyed by the community. Most recently, there have been limitations on inclusion of transgender and gender diverse people in the military, efforts to reduce collection of gender identity data, which is important for the health and well being of gender diverse people. About a year ago in Massachusetts, we had a ballot measure to rescind public accommodations protections for transgender and gender diverse people. And recently there was also a Supreme Court decision to support service providers who selectively discriminate against same-sex couples. So it's a complicated time we live in and certainly a focus on health equity for LGBTQ plus people is one that needs to take into account the societal context in which we operate. Why is it important to have health programs and medical education specifically for LGBTQ plus people? Healthy People 2020 and the Institute of Medicine, two large federal initiatives, convened national experts, reviewed the existing literature, and concluded that there really are unique health disparities faced by LGBTQ plus communities, and that the way to address these health disparities is to tailor and develop health systems that are patient-centered and responsive to the sexual orientation and gender identity of all patients. We've used the term LGBTQ plus a few times as if it's one homogenous population where everybody has the same experiences and the same health needs. The reality is each of these subpopulations, and I've used commas here intentionally to distinguish them, have unique experiences and unique health needs. So let's talk through some of these concepts and terminology a little bit together to make sure we're all on the same page. There are a lot of 
words, terms that get used when we first start focusing on improving care for gender and sexual minority people that can be overwhelming and confusing initially. Let's go through it slowly to make sure we all understand the terms being used. The first big point to make is regarding the concept of sex assigned at birth. When babies are born in most countries and cultures around the world, they're typically assigned a sex at birth based on biological factors, whether it's external anatomy or chromosomes or, or some combination. Most often assigned either female or male sex at birth, in some cases intersex status based on having anatomy that doesn't traditionally fit into uh, notions that we've had historically of being either female or male. So sex assigned at birth is really a biological construct. What is gender identity? This is a person's inner sense of being a girl, woman, boy, man, something else in terms of gender or having no gender at all. We appreciate that these babies assigned to sex at birth grow up, become children, adolescents, and adults who may have a gender identity, an inner sense of their gender that doesn't align in a conventional sense with the sex they were assigned when they were born. We also appreciate that many people have a gender identity that doesn't fit one of the two traditional options of either being a girl or a boy, either being a woman or a man. So we appreciate that many people have non-binary gender identities. And here we see the gender identity continuum. In summary, there are many other terms that people will use to describe their gender identity. We see a continuum that includes more traditionally binary identifications, like identifying as a woman or as a transgender woman, identifying as a man or a transgender man, and then a range of non-binary or gender diverse or gender expansive identifications that also exist. That's gender identity. In contrast, sexual orientation is how a person identifies their physical, emotional, and romantic attachments to other people. And we think of this typically in three categories. The first is attraction. This is whom someone is attracted to, whom they desire in an intimate context. When I was in medical school, I was trained to ask, are you attracted to women, men, or both? We moved beyond that. Now we ask, who are you attracted to generally, or what are the genders of the people you're attracted to, to acknowledge the fact that there are more than two possible genders. The second component is behavior, and this refers to whom someone is or isn't engaging in sexual activity with and what kind of sexual activity they may or may not be engaging in. Something we're very focused on in my field of psychiatry or behavioral health and also in the field of infectious disease, for example, where we're focused on transmission of sexually transmitted infections. And the third component of sexual orientation is identity. This refers to the range of labels and communities that exist in society that a person may or may not affiliate with regarding their sexual orientation. So some of the more common terms that we may know are gay, lesbian, bisexual, straight, queer. There are many other terms as well. We have a glossary of terms on our website at lgbthealtheducation.org that we revised last year, and now we're in the process of revising it substantially again, just because the way people are conceptualizing their identities and defining them, referring to them, is evolving so quickly. What does the Q stand for? It can stand for a couple of things. It can stand for questioning, someone who's exploring their sexual orientation or gender identity and hasn't yet settled on a particular one. It can also stand for queer, which historically was a derogatory term, a slur for gay and lesbian people, which has been taken back by the community, reclaimed, and is used by many people with great pride. It indicates generally that someone doesn't identify as straight, but also doesn't necessarily identify with gay, lesbian, or bisexual identities. With all of these terms, an important point is one of self-identification. We can't assume someone is comfortable identifying in a particular way because of their sexual behavior, for example. We have to ask them in healthcare and document sexual orientation and gender identity based on what they tell us, not based on how they look, how they sound, or what their behavior is. A critical point to make is that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. These are two different experiences, two different concepts. Everyone has both a sexual orientation and a gender identity. Each of us on this webinar has one of each. And 
The terms people use to define their sexual orientation or gender identity will evolve throughout their life. Someone may initially identify as a man and later identify as a woman. Someone may initially identify as straight and later identify as queer, for example. And the terms we've used throughout history have also evolved. The terminology used now is different than what we were working with 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, even a year or two ago. I'm hearing new terms, particularly from my younger gender and sexual minority patients in the last four to six months that I hadn't heard even a year ago. As Kate mentioned earlier, there are unfortunately a range of health disparities either uniquely or disproportionately experienced by gender and sexual minority people that start young in childhood and evolve and persist in many cases into older adulthood. The way we understand these health disparities among gender and sexual minority people in clinical care and research and policy increasingly is related to the minority stress framework. In this framework, we understand that gender and sexual minority people developmentally experience everyday discrimination, victimization, microaggressions, frank violence, unfortunately, at a higher prevalence in the general population. We think of all of this as external stigma-related stress. All this stress over time can take a toll for many people lead to disruptions in general psychological processes like coping skills, emotional regulation, interpersonal functioning, having beliefs or cognitive structures, as we say, that aren't necessarily super adaptive, like believing it's never going to get better, nobody can be trusted, no one will ever love me. And all this external stigma-related stress can contribute to internal stigma-related stress, internalized homophobia, internalized transphobia, believing all the negative things society has to say about your identity, expecting rejection because you're so used to it, and in many cases, identity concealment to prevent being mistreated or abused. All of this stress we think is related to what we see in the research, which is a much higher prevalence of various behavioral health problems, like a higher prevalence of depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use disorders as a way to cope with all this stress, decreased self-care, decreased engagement in healthcare, including primary care, and down the road, a higher prevalence of various physical health problems among gender and sexual minority people as well. So we're really interested in healthcare in thinking about how we can turn the crisis of chronic minority stress into an opportunity for people to develop adaptive coping skills. Instead of developing responses that may include identity concealment, social disengagement, lack of participation in routine healthcare, how is this an opportunity to foster effective identity management, adaptive learned coping skills, more connection to community, and participation in routine healthcare as a way to solve certain problems? And we consider it a responsibility and duty of ours as clinicians to ensure that we're proactively trying to turn this experience of minority stress into an opportunity to foster health-promoting behaviors and improve physical and mental health outcomes. Just to briefly review some of the disparities that we have alluded to, unfortunately, abuse and violence are much more common among gender and sexual minority people than in the general population. Schools are often still unwelcoming environments for gender and sexual minority students with much higher rates of physical, verbal, and sexual abuse than experienced by other peers. Intimate partner violence among gender and sexual minority people is often underreported. It's something that police often don't know how to handle. Perpetrators are often not charged. And services for intimate partner violence are often not inclusive and welcoming of gender and sexual minority people. Hate crimes are much more prevalent towards gender and sexual minority people than many other populations. And the FBI has consistently reported in recent years that the population in the United States with the highest prevalence of hate crimes is African-American transgender women. So this is unfortunately the danger and horrific reality that many people continue to live with. As was mentioned, substance use disorders are much more prevalent among gender and sexual minority people. We have data here from SAMHSA on the right side showing that every type of drug use disorder is significantly more common among 
sexual minority people than among sexual majority people. Sexual minority youth initiate alcohol and illicit drug use earlier than their peers. Sexual minority women have higher risk of alcohol and drug use disorders. Sexual minority men have higher risk for drug use disorders. And bisexual people have higher risk for all substance use disorders than even gay and lesbian populations. That's often in the context of increased stigma even within sexual minority communities toward bisexual people. Tobacco use is unfortunately much more prevalent among transgender adults and sexual minority adults than among straight and cisgender adults. It's also more common among queer and trans youth than it is among straight and uh, cisgender youth. There is a lot of interest now in understanding differences in prevalence and use patterns of vaping among gender and sexual minority communities compared with other folks. Psychiatric disorders, unfortunately, are more common among sexual minority people as well. Sexual minority men are more likely to have major depressive disorder, panic disorder, and at least two co-occurring disorders than their straight counterparts. And sexual minority women are more likely to experience generalized anxiety disorder and at least two co-occurring disorders than their sexual majority counterparts. Suicidal ideation and attempts are much more common among queer and trans youth than in uh, their counterparts. And suicide attempts, unfortunately, are much more common among gender minority people, uh, trans youth and adults than in uh, the general population and higher than in any other subpopulation in the United States that we're aware of. It's important to note that HIV incidence is highest in the U.S. among black men who have sex with men and transgender women of color, black and African-American transgender women, and Hispanic Latinx transgender women. This is really where the epidemic is concentrated and focused now in terms of new infections. Gay and bisexual men often do not receive the care needed with regard to HIV. 83% are diagnosed. Of those, only 62% receive care, only 48% of those are retained in care, and only 52% of those achieve viral suppression. So we have a lot more work to do in terms of HIV uh, treatment and viral suppression, particularly in communities of color. There are disparities in access to HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, to prevent HIV in populations at high risk, use of antiretroviral medication to do so, while 44% of people who could benefit from PrEP are African American, only about 1% were prescribed PrEP, and while 25% of people who could benefit from PrEP are Latinx, only 3% of those were prescribed PrEP. An important note about sexually transmitted infections among sexual minority women, practices will vary with a lot of diversity among sexual minority women. Many sexual minority women may have had sex in the past or be having sex with men. There are limited data on STIs, but risks clearly exist with regard to herpes simplex virus, the human papillomavirus, and bacterial vaginosis. It's important to note that providers will often not do appropriate screening based on report of same-sex behavior among women. So it's important to continue to consider and perform screening for STIs based on guidelines that exist for women, regardless of the presence of same-sex sexual behavior. Sexually transmitted infections among transgender and gender diverse people should be uh, assessed, screened for, treated based on current anatomy and sexual behavior, not based on identity. So we really need to look into behavior, the anatomy that's present, and make uh, clinical decisions accordingly. Cancer screening is an area with many disparities and a lot of room for improvement. Sexual minority women experience disparities with regard to screening for breast cancer and cervical cancer when the guidelines really call for the same cancer screening and vaccination for all women. Sexual minority men are at increased risk of anal cancer, particularly when living with HIV, and access to uh, preventative care in this regard, high-resolution anoscopy or even pap tests is something that is limited nationally and often only available in certain centers of excellence. 
transgender women can experience breast cancer. There are case reports of this. And transgender men who retain a cervix require um, screening for HPV and cervical pap tests. And this is something that we need to do much more training and implementation around. Transgender communities often report denial of insurance coverage for hormones, even though this is considered medically necessary by the American Medical Association since 2008. Also considered medically necessary by the AMA is gender-affirming surgery. Despite that, folks report 55% denial of insurance coverage, even when they're able to access competent, confident providers. Transgender communities often report being refused treatment, verbally harassed, physically or sexually assaulted within the context of interacting with healthcare providers and having to teach providers about care related to their gender identity. 23% also reported not seeking needed care due to fear of being mistreated related to their gender identity. This is a paper we published a couple of months ago in the American Journal of Public Health looking nationally at the prevalence of gender identity conversion efforts, efforts to convert the gender identity of transgender people to cisgender, so trying to make people no longer identify as transgender. This is a very condemned practice that has been found to uh, be unethical, and recently we also published a paper showing that this is associated with significant increased risk of suicide attempts. As you can see, unfortunately, it still occurs in every state nationally in D.C. and Puerto Rico. And we found it's occurred in every state as recently as 2015 with a lifetime uh, prevalence of exposure among transgender people nationally of 13.5%. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of adopting a gender affirming framework, not a gender identity conversion framework that's still highly prevalent. Finally, I'd just like to end on a note about the ways in which our field as healthcare professionals, we can really move things forward in creating a more inclusive and affirming society for gender and sexual minority people. Historically, there's been a failure within the medical field to accept naturally occurring gender diversity with operations on, and biological diversity with operations on intersex babies to make their bodies fit a gender binary. There's a move away from this now. Perceptions of gender diversity as deviant, which are shifting in 2013. There was a shift in the DSM-5 of psychiatric disorders from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria, which is still evolving as a diagnosis. Perceptions of same-sex sexual behavior as deviant have evolved significantly. A huge moment for this was removing homosexuality from the DSM in 1973. There's movement to uh, move away from conversion efforts, as we were mentioning earlier, or reparative therapies, as they are often referred to. The American Medical Association started opposing this in 1994. California banned conversion efforts as the first state to do so in 2012 this year. Massachusetts became the 16th state to do so, Colorado the 18th state to do so, but most states still don't have bans on this damaging practice. And finally, sexual orientation and gender identity, data collection and healthcare, a strong recommendation by the Institute of Medicine and Healthy People 2020. This uh, started in national surveys for sexual orientation in 2012, and the U.S. Bureau of Primary Healthcare mandated in 2016 that all 1,400 health centers nationally had to report on sex orientation and gender identity for all patients. So things are really moving forward. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to talk about how we can overcome these barriers through medical education. 